Today we're going to take a look at regional anesthesia for breast surgery. I want to first brush through an, an enhanced recovery after surgery protocol for breast surgery. And like other ERAS protocols, there's a focus on the pre-admission education piece, the pre-admission optimization piece, which includes weight loss, abstinence from smoking, alcohol, abstinence of a month. Um, there's a focus on preventing dehydration with fasting, so a carbohydrate load with a malodextrin-based drink, such as Ensure Clear Fast or even just Gatorade, which is not malodextrin but does have the carb load, uh, is recommended. So basically what I tell patients is to have a 24-ounce Gatorade before bed, and when they wake up, take 12 ounces of Gatorade greater than two hours before operative time. There is a focus on venous thromboembolism prophylaxis, antimicrobial prophylaxis, a real emphasis on PONV, which includes a multimodal approach of um, odansetron and scopolamine. Now, in breast cancer surgery, dexamethasone is somewhat controversial, and we'll talk about that a little bit later. And lastly, a multimodal approach to pain management. So we want to make sure these patients get ketorolac or celecoxib prior to surgery, prior to incision. There's some pretty good data that prior to incision, ketorolac may actually prevent metastasis, and so emphasis should be placed there. Also on acetaminophen, gabapentin, we'll talk more about in a little bit. We want to keep the patients warm. We want to keep them euvolemic. We want early out of bed, early feeding postoperatively, early mobilization. All right, so what's our pain protocol for breast surgery? We want to have a regional technique. So this could be the PEX-2 block or a serratus plane block. It could be paravertebral block or a rector spinae block. We want to try to avoid volatile anesthetics if possible. So by using a TIVA technique, we'll get a 15% reduction in post-op nausea vomiting. But further than that, it's thought that the volatile anesthetics may at some level be immunomodulating, and it may have some benefit due to the anti-tumorigenic properties of propofol to use a TIVA-based technique. We want ketorolac, and you want to consider maybe some gabapentin. Uh, patient is not frail, not elderly, not sleep apnea. You may want to give 300 or 600 uh, milligrams of gabapentin pre-incision. Acetaminophen is always a good thing to do. We want to give 1,000 milligrams or two extra strength Tylenols um, prior to incision. By giving Tylenol, you'll have a 30 to 50% opioid reduction postoperatively. Um, there still may be some postoperative pain, and so we want to have a regimen that includes the appropriate dose and not overdoing it. So maybe 5 milligrams of oxycodone for breakthrough and some parenteral opioid. We want to not lose focus on the holistic approach, and this has to do with helping a patient prevent suffering. We know that pain may be at some level inevitable, but suffering is optional, is the saying. So if we can help a patient focus with relaxation techniques, breathing, meditation, positive affirmation, music therapy, and other techniques, we may offer some benefit. For the PEX blocks, types 1, 2, and 3, our novel techniques to block the pectoral, intercostal brachial, third to six intercostals, long thoracic, and thoracodorsal nerves. Now, anytime you put a needle near the chest, you have to be aware that you could cause a pneumothorax. Now, if you visualize the needle tip from start to finish and you recognize the pleura on the screen, you will not have a pneumothorax. But anytime performing a chest wall technique, you should have the ability to deal with a pneumothorax if it occurs. We want to minimize our risk from hematoma by visualizing the needle tip and keeping it away from blood vessels. And we want to see our local anesthesia spread on the field. If we see it spread under ultrasound guidance, we know it's not going into a vein. And that will minimize our risk for systemic toxicity. Also, we want to use the lowest effective dose, so the lowest concentration and the lowest volume needed. 
We want to be cautious of the long thoracic thoracodorsal nerves, lateral medial pectoral nerves to prevent injury. So here's some data on the pectoral nerve block or pex block. Um, the truth is one in eight women develop breast cancer during their lifetime. And 40% of women will have severe acute pain after breast surgery. And 50% will develop chronic post-mastectomy pain with impaired quality of life. The thought is that decreased persistent pain will decrease central sensitization or wind-up of pain pathways and may lower the incidence of opioid-induced hyperalgesia. The mantra is that effective acute pain management can prevent chronic pain. And by preventing acute pain, we can preserve immune function by suppressing the surgical stress response, the need for general anesthesia, and perioperative opioids. Opioids, especially morphine, inhibit both cellular and humoral immunity. And on the day when a tumor is removed by surgery, we want the body to be as immunocompetent as possible to scavenge up any cancer cells. And any intervention that we can do to minimize the immunomodulation that occurs perioperatively may offer some benefit to the patient's ultimate survival. So in this study for the PEX block, it was noted that the pain spores were less in the PEX group. Postoperative morphine consumption was lower in the first 12 hours. There was lower intraoperative fentanyl consumption. Nausea and vomiting as well as sedation scores were lower in the PACU. The PACU and hospital stays were shorter in the PEX group than in the control group. Now if you note these two groups, we have the intervention group and we have the non-intervention group. And at hour zero, the VAS was one in the PEX block group and five in the non-intervention group. Now if we can offer our patients a pain score of one versus five after surgery, I think the answer is obvious. You can note here that the morphine consumption is less now in the control group, in the first four hours, four milligrams of morphine was utilized versus zero in the PEX block group. Now going from four to zero can really prevent side effects. We might prevent sedation, nausea, constipation, delirium, all of significant benefit to the patient. I even found a trial that showed that the PEX block provided superior postoperative analgesia than the paravertebral block. And certainly, the PEX block is easier to perform and probably offers less risk of pneumothorax. So here's a look at the technique. This is from In a this website video, we will show you how to scan and the sonar anatomy required to perform a PEX2 block. There are numerous potential indications for this block, such as breast surgery or any surgery involving the chest wall. It should reliably provide analgesia between T1 and T5. This block is usually performed with 30 mils of 0.25% levopipivacaine divided into two injections, 10 mils between pec major and pec minor, and 20 mils between pec minor and serratus anterior. Care should be taken when performing bilateral blocks to ensure that the toxic dose is not exceeded. We will now go through the neural innervation of the anterior chest wall and breast. This consists of the supraclavicular nerve to the superior aspect of the chest wall, the medial and lateral pectoral nerves responsible for sensory, motor and sympathetic innervation to the pectoral muscles, the thoracodorsal nerve responsible for innervation to latissimus dorsi, the long thoracic nerve responsible for innervation to serratus anterior, and the lateral and anterior intercostal cutaneous nerve branches of T2 to T6. In this illustration, we will go through the anatomy relevant to the pex block. Underneath the skin and subcutaneous tissue lies the clavicle and pectoralis major muscle. Deep to pectoralis major lies pectoralis minor. 
and in the plane between pec major and pec minor lie the pectoral branch of the thoracochromial artery and the lateral pectoral nerve. At the lateral border of pec minor, you will see serratus anterior and the lateral intercostal cutaneous branches. If we zoom in here on the image, you will identify that the medial pectoral nerve lies underneath pec minor and pierces it at its medial border to lie in the same plane as the lateral pectoral nerve along with the pectoral branch of the thoracochromial artery. To start scanning for the pex block, place the probe in a paramedial orientation, just making contact with the clavicle, similar to the position for an infraclavicular block. The image generated will look like this, with the clavicle demonstrated cephalad, the pectoralis major muscle superficially, deep to that pec minor, and you may also identify subclavius. Deep to the muscular structures, you'll identify the axillary artery and the axillary vein. If a rib is visualised, it is likely to be the second rib, and you can see the pleura lying adjacent to it. From this initial scan position, the probe is slid down the patient's chest in a cordad direction, counting the ribs as you go. In this schematic, you can see pec major and pec minor, the interfascial plane between them, and the second and the third rib. Once the third rib is identified, the probe is rotated through 90 degrees and slid towards the lateral aspect of the chest wall. Once you reach the lateral aspect of the pectoralis minor muscle, the image generated allows you to identify pec major, pec minor, one of the pectoral branches of the thoracochromial artery between the two of them, and the third and fourth rib. At this point, this is the optimal position to sight the pex block. Shown here is the needle insertion point over the anterior part of the chest, directed laterally. In this block video, you will see the needle introduced from the left-hand side of the screen, from the medial part of the chest wall, directed laterally. It's aiming to identify the fascial plane between pec major superficially and pec minor deep to it. As the local anaesthetic is spreading, you can identify the two pectoral branches of the thoracochromial artery and a hyperechoic structure on the left of them, which may well represent the lateral pectoral nerve. After 10 mils of local anaesthetic is injected, the needle is advanced through pec minor to identify the fascial plane between pec minor and serratus anterior. Injection of 20 mils of local anaesthetic here is causing this fascial plane to open up and local anaesthetic is directed laterally towards the axilla. Here are some tips to optimise your chances of success. Ensure that you have optimal ergonomics and positioning between yourself and the ultrasound machine. You can either stand on the contralateral side of the patient, needling along your line of sight, or stand at the head end of the patient. Although you can needle this block in or out of plane, we recommend in-plane needling to optimise needle tip visualisation. When performing the block, ensure that you identify the pectoral branches of the thoracochromial artery, the pleura and the needle tip at all times. As an aid, you can use the superior surface of the third or the fourth rib as a target or a stopgap to ensure that the needle does not traverse deep to them towards the pleura. If performing bilateral blocks in patients less than 70 kg, you may need to dilute down your local anaesthetic to ensure that you don't go over the toxic level. All right, so let's go over the chest wall innervation. So we have the intercostal nerves, and they lie at the back between the pleura and the posterior intercostal membrane. They run between the intercostal muscles to the sternum. But as you can see here, they give off a lateral branch. And that lateral branch pierces the external intercostal and the serratus anterior muscle at the mid-axillary line to give off the anterior and posterior terminal branches. These are what are blocked during our PEX2 regional technique. The lateral cutaneous branch of the second intercostal nerve does not divide in the anterior and posterior branches, and it's called the intercostal brachial nerve. So we've heard about the intercostal brachial nerve when we do supraclavicular blocks for AV fistulas. We also do a separate block for the intercostal brachial nerve. Well, it turns out the intercostal brachial nerve is actually the T2 intercostal nerve and just has different nomenclature. 
So here's a, an image showing the medial and lateral pectoral nerve. They're the blocks, they're the nerves that are blocked during a PEX1 block. Then we have a look at the medial cutaneous nerve, which comes off of the brachial plexus, the intercostal brachial nerve, which is really the posterior branch of T2. And then we see the T2 through T6 giving off the anterior and posterior terminal branches. Running down the side chest wall is the long thoracic nerve. And in the back there is the thoracodorsal nerve. So here's a nice uh, gross dissection of the nerves involved. And we can see our anterior cutaneous branches, our supraclavicular nerves, which comes off the superficial cervical plexus, the anterior divisions, and the posterior divisions of the cutaneous nerve. So the intercostal nerve comes around, gives off a lateral branch, which gives off the anterior and posterior divisions, which is what we're blocking. Now the long thoracic nerve comes from C5 to C7, a very board relevant nerve entering the axilla behind the brachial plexus resting on the serratus anterior muscle. A lesion of the long thoracic nerve gives a wing scapula. It's most prominent when the arm is lifted forward or when the patient pushes the outstretched arm against the wall. Then we have the thoracodorsal nerve, which is the branch of the posterior cord. It follows the thoracal dorsal artery and innervates the latissimus dorsa in the posterior wall of the axilla. Now, as far as the lateral and medial pectoral nerves, they're mostly motor nerves, but they do carry proprioceptive and nociceptive fibers. The lateral pectoral nerve is important in the pain response after breast augmentation and mastectomy, and especially in the breast implant surgery when the implant is inserted by the subpectoral route. So the lateral and medial pectoral nerves are blocked during the PEX-1 block. Now I will note that some recent literature has shown that the PEX-1 nerve block may not add any analgesia to breast surgery over just performing the PEX-2 block. And frequently I will only perform the PEX-2 block and not perform the PEX-1 block. That being said, the target is right in the visual field and it's easy enough to block. All right, quick look at the brachial plexus. So we have C5, C6 forming an upper trunk, C7 the middle trunk, 8 and T1 the lower trunk. Each trunk gives a posterior division to form a posterior cord. Posterior cord gives off the radial and axillary nerves. The anterior divisions from the middle and upper trunk form the lateral cord. Lateral cord gives a musculocutaneous nerve. That gives your lateral antebrachial sensory nerve as well as the flexion at the bicep and supination. The medial cord gives off the ulnar nerve. Ulnar nerve, we all know what that does. You can see that the lateral pectoral nerve gives comes off of the lateral cord. We can see that the medial pectoral nerve comes off of the medial cord. We have C5, 6, and 7 giving off the long thoracic nerve, and everything else is labeled. We have two or three major muscles to think about here. We have the pec major, the thick chest wall muscle. Under that, the pec minor, and under that, the serratus anterior. The needle for a pex 1 block is going to go between the pec major and minor, and the needle for a pex 2 block is going to go between the pec minor and the serratus anterior. In the bottom right, you get a good look at that model of the pec major, pec minor, serratus, and latissimus dorsa. So serratus anterior, what is that? There are eight muscles on ribs 1 to 8. They insert on the medial border of the scapula, and it draws the scapula forward. And the inferior ones rotate the scapula superiorly, innervated by the long thoracic nerve. So let's focus in on the PEX 1 and 2 block. They were invented by Rafael Blanco in 2011 and 12. The PEX 1 block is a needle between the PEC major and the PEC minor to get spread around the medial and lateral pectoral nerves. The motor nerves that also have nociceptive afferents and some fibers for proprioception. The PEX2 block is a technique where the medication goes between the PEC minor and the serratus anterior, and 20 mLs will take away pain from the anterior and posterior divisions of the intercostal nerves.
So we really have three compartments that we speak of, the pectoral compartment, the axillary compartment, and the serratus compartment. So for the PEX-1 block, we have a linear ultrasound probe. We use the probe position that's used for the infraclavicular plexus block. We identify the PEC major, and we check the location of the pectoral branch of the thoracochromial artery between the PEC major and minor muscle. You can use Doppler to find this artery. The lateral pectoral nerve is consistently located adjacent to the artery. So if you found the artery, you found the nerve. We use our standard block needles and put 10 mLs between the pec major and minor around the pectoral branch of the thoracochromial artery to get the medial and lateral pectoral nerves. The top right picture here shows what die spread looks like in this plane. In the middle, we can see our probe position and our needle position for insertion. The middle right picture shows the pec major muscle, the pec minor muscle, the pectoral branch of the thoracochromial artery, and the medial and lateral pectoral nerve adjacent to it. I want to point out the bottom left picture here. We see the pec major, minor, and serratus muscles, and we see a rib. When ultrasound hits bone, the cortical bone shines white. But since the ultrasound waves cannot penetrate the bone, you get dropout below it. In between the two ribs seen in the picture, there is a thick white line. This white line is the pleura. If we bring our needle through the pec major, through the pec minor muscle, and above the serratus anterior, over a rib, we will not get a pneumothorax. This is our PEX2 block distribution. As you can see there is some medial or center chest wall sparing. So this block will not be adequate for sternotomy. So for the PEX2 block technique, we have to decide do we want to go between the PEC minor and the serratus anterior or do we want to go subfascial inside the serratus anterior muscle. I think the data is still being worked out whether or not to go between the serratus anterior and the pec minor or subfascial on the serratus anterior. But the prominent thinking is that if you're subfascial on the serratus anterior, i.e. on the rib, you may have a quicker absorption because the muscle is more vascular. So when I have my choice, I like to put the needle between the serratus anterior and the pec minor. The top right is showing ribs three, four, and five. It's showing the pec major, minor, and serratus anterior. Now the serratus anterior is all the hypoechoic muscle around the ribs and above the pleura. Ideally, we put our needle over a rib so we don't have inadvertent pleural puncture. So again, we start infraclavicularly and the first rib we see on the screen is rib two. We move caudal and lateral as we cross three and we see our fourth rib. When we have our fourth rib, the needle goes in plane through the pec major and minor, pierces the minor and stays in between the minor and serratus anterior plane and we put 20 mLs of local anesthetic. The top right picture here in purple shows the spread of both the PEX1 block, labeled 1, and the PEX2 block, labeled 2. This is an MRI after PEX2 block where gadolinium was injected in the plane between the serratus anterior and the PEX minor. And you can see how nicely the gadolinium spread and how T2 to T6 would be covered. Now a third block I want to talk about is called the serratus plane block, also known as the PEX3 block. This is a very easy technique that is very safe and will get wider spread or coverage than a PEX2 block. 
The local anesthesia is placed in the potential space under the latissimus dorsi above the serratus anterior. Now, everyone, feel their latissimus dorsi with their hand. It's a very thick muscle. It's very easy to find. If the linear probe is placed over it, you see this thick muscle, and under it is a serratus anterior muscle. The plane between the two muscles is your serratus plane. This will block the thoracic intercostal nerves and provide complete analgesia of the lateral part of the thorax. This can be effective for rib fracture, for VATS, thoracotomy, breast surgery, cutaneous wounds. So the probe is placed over the midclavicular line region of the thoracic cage in the sagittal plane, the fifth rib in the mid axillary line. The needle depth was constant at between one and two centimeters. As an extra reference point, you can look for the thoracodorsal artery to aid in identi identification of the plane superficial to the serratus muscle. The needles introduced in plane with respect to ultrasound probe from superior anterior to posterior inferior. We want to inject the local between the two muscles in a large volume, probably 40 mLs of say 0.25% ropivacaine or bupivacaine. You can see how the distribution here is not only on the front chest wall, but extends to the posterior chest wall, becoming applicable to VATS, thoracic midcaps, thoracotomies, and rib fractures. The serratus plane in PEX3 block is shown here, showing the latissimus dorsum muscle and the serratus anterior. The blue shape is showing the potential spread. Now remember, the lateral cutaneous branches of the intercostal nerves penetrate through this layer. So when we put our local between the latissimus dorsa and the serratus anterior, all of the lateral cutaneous branches from T2, possibly down to T10, are covered, which will take away the pain that the intercostal nerve gives to its anterior and posterior cutaneous branches. Image 2 on the right shows how this block could be performed in the lateral decubitus position, and image 1 on the left shows how it could be performed in the supine position. Here's a needle image on the upper left showing the needle between the latissimus dorsa and the serratus anterior spreading in that plane. The bottom there's three images showing the PEX1, 10 mLs of local anesthetic between the PEC major and the PEC minor around the pectoral branch of the thoracoacromial artery to get the medial and lateral pectoral nerve. The second image shows local anesthesia above the fourth rib. In this image, it's showing it below the serratus anterior muscle, although it also could be performed between the serratus anterior muscle and the pec minor muscle. 20 mLs of local anesthetic is placed after aspiration. And the third image is showing the serratus plane block or the pex 3 block. 30 to 40 mLs at the fifth rib between the latissimus dorsa and the serratus anterior muscle. Just another image to reinforce where PEX1 versus PEX2 block is performed. The probe will need some subtle adjustments between the two blocks. And here's an image of gadolinium spread on MRI after a serratus plane block. And we can see how the spread would get the lateral branches of the intercostal nerve as they exteriorize to become the anterior and posterior cutaneous branches. Again, a split screen showing PEX1, PEX2, and PEX3 block. As you can see in the bottom middle image, the needle is brought over the fourth rib to prevent inadvertent pleural puncture. X block.
place the probe in a paramedian orientation, just making contact with the clavicle, similar to the position for an infraclavicular block. The image generated will look like this, with the clavicle demonstrated kephalad, the pectoralis major muscle superficially, deep to that pec minor, and you may also identify subclavius. Deep to the muscular structures, you'll identify the axillary artery and the axillary vein. If a rib is visualised, it is likely to be the second rib, and you can see the pleura lying adjacent to it. From this initial scan position, the probe is slid down the patient's chest in a chordad direction, counting the ribs as you go. In this schematic, you can see pec major and pec minor, the interfascial plane between them, and the second and the third rib. Once the third rib is identified, the probe is rotated through 90 degrees and slid towards the lateral aspect of the chest wall. Once you reach the lateral aspect of the pectoralis minor muscle, the image generated allows you to identify pec major, pec minor, one of the pectoral branches of the thoracoacromial artery between the two of them, and the third and fourth rib. At this point, this is the optimal position to site the pec block. Shown here is the needle insertion point over the anterior part of the chest, directed laterally. In this block video, you will see the needle introduced from the left-hand side of the screen, from the medial part of the chest wall, directed laterally. It's aiming to identify the fascial plane between pec major superficially and pec minor deep to it. As the local anaesthetic is spreading, you can identify the two pectoral branches of the thoracochromial artery and a hyperechoic structure on the left of them, which may well represent the lateral pectoral nerve. After 10 mils of local anaesthetic is injected, the needle is advanced through pec minor to identify the fascial plane between pec minor and serratus anterior. Injection of 20 mils of local anaesthetic here is causing this fascial plane to open up and local anaesthetic is directed laterally towards the axilla. I also want to briefly discuss the pectoral intercostal fascial plane block for sternum pain. This is an injection located between the pectoralis major muscle and the internal intercostal muscle. And it's meant to get the medial branch of the intercostal nerve for sternotomy pain. Data on this is still evolving, but it is an option for your midline sternotomy patients. Thank you guys. That was a quick look at regional anesthesia for breast surgery. We touched upon enhanced recovery after surgery, including preoperative education, multimodal approach to pain management, as well as regional anesthesia techniques. If you have any questions, feel free to reach out to me at any time. Thanks. Bye-bye.